Hi, Lindsay. Welcome. Hi, Terrell. How are you guys? Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Terrell. How are you? Good. You can hear me okay? Sure can. Excellent. How was, how was the weekend? Uh, it was great. I got to see my grandson yesterday and we celebrated my son's birthday he turned uh 21 wow so pretty exciting good for you what's it like being a grandfather that's amazing <laughs> actually he's sorry my son's 22 my bad uh very good very good um yeah uh, i knew it could happen so uh, it was my 45th birthday present uh, in November, he came on the 26th and my birthday was the 28th. So I don't think you can top that for a birthday gift. <laughs> Magnificent. Good for you. That is so great. I'm I'm the young guy in one of my uh, friendship circles, uh, always called the kid. And they're all going through the grandparent stage and I'm not quite there yet. My guys are still practicing and um I guess that's where all the fun is in the practicing. So <laughs> we'll see. They need to get themselves a little bit more settled. But uh, one fresh out of university, the other one's been at a university for, oh gosh, I guess, uh, I think we're coming up. I was going to say coming up on three years. It might be four years. My goodness, that time flies by. Hi, Lindsay. How was your weekend? My weekend was good. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. How are you guys doing with the with profiling your people? Are you looking at people like you? You? Sorry. Sometimes with the auction, it just moves so quickly. Like we had a busy, busy week this week. And it's just like it, it just moved too fast for me to even. Wow. Wow. Yeah, Isn't that yeah. great, though? Yeah. So uh, like a, a lot of people buying, there's a frenzy of buying or a frenzy of selling or a lot of listing and not a lot of action. Market was actually pretty strong last week. Uh, we were actually surprised. Our management actually came in and was like, is there some sort of special promo that's going on that I didn't know about? Because <laughs> the, the prices were good. So. Isn't that it? Sell prices were good or buy prices were good or just both? Uh, the buyers were coming up. So, okay. So does that mean the American market is uh, protecting themselves against the recession or they think they're over the recession or they're just getting ahead of it? I don't know. All I know is that there were a good, healthy mix of U.S. and Canadian buyers last week. Fantastic. Wonderful. Seeing the same sort of thing, uh, Terrell? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. Great. You guys are really going to enjoy this one. This is a lot of fun today because what we've talked about is, okay, here are the four behaviors and you go looking for those behaviors based on the cadence of what they speak and, and some of the um, body language that, that can lend itself to that based on smiling or not smiling. And then we talked about generating the subconscious positive prejudice because of um, the, the dialogue and the conversation that we'll have with them. And that's part and parcel with the three ways that we communicate being, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> content, our voice, and then of course, body language. So we're going to dive deep into body language today, which is a lot of fun because 
you can leverage this virtually. I don't want to suggest that this only works when you go and meet people in person. And so when whenever we start with um, with a buyer, and especially depending on how far they are away, I know I've been saying all the way along, get familiar with Zoom or whatever virtual platform you want to use. But as this first month of the year closes, you really want to be getting familiar with doing Zoom presentations, especially with those American buyers, because this is how you get to read their body language. More importantly, I think they absolutely love it because they get to see you, but we just can't get there at all. And using the phone enough, your voice sometimes just isn't that much. So if your audience is not familiar with the platform, this is the easiest way to start a meeting. Everybody makes the assumption, and I'm making that hasty generalization as well, right? That everybody assumes that everyone knows Zoom or Teams or GoToMeeting or WebEx, whatever virtual platform you use. Don't make that assumption. Try to start getting your clients to show up on Zoom and then start off with, if you're a Zoomer or expert, please bear with me. If they cannot hear you and they're reading the subtitles, and that's why I love the subtitles running at the bottom of my presentation all the time, then you can tell them right here in the subtitles to click join with computer audio. And of course, if they don't have computer audio still, you may, you could tell them, minimize this window. You'll see possibly another window with that message on it. Join with computer audio. If that still doesn't work and you can't hear them and they're probably trying to desperately tell you, I don't know how this works, I don't know, how, and they're getting frustrated, then tell them to click on the chat window button down at the bottom. And then, of course, they can type in and you can carry on with your presentation, but you could alert them to the fact that the speaker icon is in the lower left hand corner as well, right by the microphone. If they click on that, that could help. They don't have to use the microphone. You want to do the presentation, but the secret is seeing them. Even if you can't hear them, you know, 50% of communication is visual. So as you go through the app to tell them all, all about it, you want to tell them about how to go to full screen by clicking the upper right-hand corner. Now I have my camera as well. You can click on video settings. I have my camera set up with the reverse position of the camera. So the normal orientation of the camera, if I were to say, click on the upper right-hand corner, it would actually look like I'm doing this. If you leave the Zoom and I found Teams is exactly the same and GoToMeeting is the same. So just in the advanced settings of your Zoom, if you start to use it more frequently, reverse the camera. And that way, when you point right and point left, then it looks like right or left, which is great. If you have a lot of people in the room and you just want them to pay attention to you, you can turn on focus mode as well. And that is the other day when you guys couldn't see your video. I, I was racking my brain. I'm like, why couldn't they see each other and realize that I had focus mode turned on? So that's a feature that now I enable depending on the room that I'm using. So if I have more than five people, for instance, in a room, I'll go to focus mode. So everybody can't necessarily see themselves, especially if people say, I don't have a camera or they say they don't want to be on camera. They say, yeah, my bandwidth isn't any good or our internet connection is bad. And, and my computer suggesting I don't look at the camera and don't be surprised with that. Yes. Software settings will analyze your internet rate of speed and suggest that you turn off video in order to maintain the connection. Oh, however, all the way along, doesn't matter who it is, always suggest to them that they close their office door and they put a sign up on their office door or on their computer or on their desk and that they wear earbuds or headphones like the two of you are doing, which suggests I'm in a meeting. Leave me alone. Don't bug me. And we want to suggest they do this when they're bidding online as well. So they're paying attention, right? They're, they're in, they're engaged. They're hearing <clears throat> they're now, do you have live auctioneer sound or it's just like eBay? It's okay. like eBay. Got it. Okay. So we don't want to, we don't want to recommend that because when I call people on sale day and they're attending a different auction than I, then, then I would lose that call to remind them. You know what I mean? <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah. Indeed. Don't, don't, don't cut yourself off to my call on auction day, please. <laughs>
<laughs> maybe what we do is we draft up a Word document that says, don't bug me. I'm online at Remarket, right? So it's all <laughs> structured for us. And we tell them, print this out, fold it here. You can get this at a templates in Microsoft Word, right? It, it's a like a, a name placard that goes on the desk, like you'd find in a normal training environment, training setup. And you just tell them, hey, print this off and keep it on your desk or tape it to your door or tape it to your window. And again, that puts them in the frame of mind. Okay, look, it's the auction. I got to pay attention and don't bug me. I'm in the auction. Don't bug me. All things that you would do with snapshots that you'd add here in a PowerPoint presentation that you could leverage in a Zoom meeting and making sure that they're focused on one thing. That's us during sale time. Something to noodle and kick around. If you tell them the point, position the point at the bottom of the screen and you guys have gone through this as well, the reactions can pop up. And as you are doing a presentation on what makes you better than the other auction houses, you can say to them, you know, if, if you don't want to interrupt me and you see something that really makes sense and that's a good thing, then give me a thumbs up, a smiley face, the red heart, whatever the case is. And when you get them involved in the presentation, they enjoy it so much more. And it challenges you to to get them involved too and, and to see that they're involved. And it reminds you, this isn't one dimensional. As much as it looks one dimensional, it is three dimensional and, and we're here and we're live and we're participating and it keeps them engaged. Now, when you engage with them and, and get them to pay attention to you and leveraging those reaction buttons uh, that you know are, are down at the very bottom, you can tell them to test it, to have fun with it. And again, Captivating the attention. That is the most important part. Uh, sometimes they, they if, if they hear a joke or if you say something that just, just makes them feel like, oh my gosh, that's so true. Like if you've ever participated in an online auction before and you, you, you did bid and then turned your attention away and came back just to learn that you were outbid, you know what I mean? This is the reason why we want you to focus on... Give me, a, give me a reaction on that. And then they could go down and they could click on it. And even though they say, yeah, 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 I'm familiar with Zoom. When you actually take them through this, you're <laughs> teaching them something beyond always pitching them, selling them. But our whole point is to get them engaged with the platform of Remarket. So how are you doing identifying these individuals of fast and slow speaking? How is that going? Are you keeping this top of mind? Lindsay, how's it going? Yeah, it's going good. I mean, currently, you know, we had such a busy week last week. And, you know, when you're making those sales calls, you're just trying to get as many done as possible, you know, before, you know, the end of the day, because, you know, you're doing counters and it was just, everything's kind of going pretty fast. So... <laughs> I can just imagine. I, I tell you, like. on Thursday, I was like, this is what it feels like to work the stock market. Now I know that I've even called become alcoholics. <laughs> and in my used car managers program, I tell guys that. Mm -hmm. you know, guys, when it comes to sale day, close your door. Like, I'm not making this up. I didn't dream this up. I didn't go, oh, what am I going to teach Terrell and Lindsay this week? I tell guys, close your door. Minimize all distractions. Turn your phone off. You're a stockbroker. Exactly like the guys trading on the floor or the or the person setting up the call for the traders on the floor. Like you miss out buying one piece of product that could earn you a, an easy five thousand dollar average gross commission. I mean, you got to keep that a secret. You can't let your boss know that. You, you've you've mm -hmm. got to take that one to the grave with you. And and if you're allowing all these distractions, anyhow, good for yeah, you. You so, know what exactly what it's like. So basically the sales calls I did make, I did go through our constant contact, which is our emailer. And I did uh, an audit on which ones were bouncing deleted accounts. And then I was following up with the franchise groups that had a traded out management team. And 
when I was making those sales calls to those new managers to try and get them on our platform, it went really well. And um, the thing is with most of the people, they're in the mean. Do you know what I mean? So that's why I'm not noticing as much because I don't have very many clients, new clients at least, that are in the drastic 5%. Good. Good. So that's probably why I'm not noticing it as much as I should, or you know what I mean? And what you want to practice is getting them talking, mm -hmm. right? Because this is the hasty generalization. And this is where we put the blinders on and we go, yeah, everybody talks like I do. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I don't really know. But when you did the exercise last week at the fast speaking and slow speaking, did you find it more challenging than just saying, yeah, yeah, yeah I get it. People speak fast and people get speak mm -hmm. slow. It's like, okay, great. Go and count to 50 as slow as you possibly can. Like, this is stupid. This is idiotic. Like, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Because it's not as obvious as what we think it is. And so if you can get them talking and you go, oh, wow, fast speaking person. Oh, wow, slow. Yeah, they may have picked up the phone. Hello. And you say to yourself, oh, fast speaking. And blah, 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 blah. the whole <laughs> point, right, is that they don't generate that subconscious negative prejudice that this person that they're talking to is annoying, frustrating, a nuisance, a liar, a cheat, or a weasel. Whether mm. it's fast or slow, we want to avoid all those negative subconscious prejudice. Drell's bumped into someone recently because he's getting a charge out of it right now. I just like how you said weasel. Yeah, yeah you know what I mean? Like, like they're, they're cute. Fast and they're speaking cuddly. weasel. Yeah, they're fast <laughs> speaking weasels, right? They're going to sneak something in on you. It, it was fascinating. My uh, my daughter's boyfriend is uh, in the market to buy a house. And very recently, he went through the experience. So he took the telephone call when he was at our house. And I think that was intentional. He wanted my advice on it. and But he didn't say anything. And, and I didn't volunteer it until he did ask. Anyhow, the, the agent said, um, and he put him on speakerphone. He goes, yeah. Your offer's good, but there's been another offer uh, on the house. And so I quietly said to him, I said, okay, so who got the house? So he says to me, he goes, okay, who got the house? He goes, well, the offer's exactly like yours. And I said, BS. If it's exactly the same as yours, then why isn't the agent that is listing the house taking that offer? Because they're double ending it, selling and buying. On the other side of the equation, my my friend is going through an agent to work with this other agent who then would present it to the anyhow, blah, blah, blah. They went through it. What the, what, what this young man's real estate agent said to him was, look, there's two offers. They're exactly the same. You need to offer more money. And I shook my head. Like, it's not how it works. You've already presented an offer. How much did they, more do they want you to offer? And the agent didn't know what to do. So then I did get on the call. I said, hey, look, it's really quite simple because the guy was a fast speaking guy. So I sped, sped up as well. And I got, got in front of him. So he realized that he's not dealing with this kid anymore. He's dealing with someone who really knows the ins and outs of negotiation. I said, how much is it? If you came in to buy a car from me, you know what it's like to buy a car. You came in to buy a car from me. I got two people on the car. And I said to you, look, we're going to take the best deal. You just need to offer more money. You look at me like I have two heads, like I'm an idiot. That's the most unrealistic thing in the world. Here's what you do. You hang up the phone. You call the other agent. You say, how much? And he goes, yeah, it's not how it works with multiple listings. I said, I said you're going to call him right now. It's your duty and your obligation. My buddy's like, Bill, I don't want the house. I don't want the house anymore. No, no, no. no. We're putting him through the ringer because that's the silliest sales tactic I've ever heard. What was happening and I could see it from a mile away. My pal is slow speaking. Real estate agent, very, very fast speaking. And the two of them were driving each other nuts. And that's why it's so important to get to the mean. Because the opportunity lies in the 15 and the 20. Anyhow, quick little example. I thought, that, I thought maybe you enjoy that. That just happened this week, which was hilarious. Wow, so, really? Yeah, it was. Yeah, <laughs> it was bad. He didn't get the house. Uh, he's very, very disappointed. My daughter's Aww. really disappointed. Yeah. And it was just bad selling tactics. Really, really mm -hmm. was. The guy was just trying to get him to, to over list. And yeah. he just should have said that. He just should have come right in and said, look, in order for you to buy this house, you're going to have to be at 270 or pardon me, 576. That's a, no two ways about it. And, and he didn't. Anyhow. Now, 
What I want to share this, this much with you is that after we've gone through all these behaviors, or all these behaviors, pardon me, you can safely assume the majority of your behavior, your, your client's behavior is dominant. Most likely everybody appears dominant. So you don't have to struggle and wrestle and frustrate yourself with this graph, but you'll see in the customer value categories that we dive into really shortly that as much as most of them act dominant, the I, the S, and the C are very prevalent. And in order for you to really win them over, where they go, you know what? That Terrell, that Lindsay, they're really smart people. I really like dealing with this auction house over the other because at the other, I'm just a number. Nobody really cares unless I buy something. That's what we want to identify a pain point. We want to solve a problem for them. That's liquidating assets, putting cash in their pocket so they can go and reinvest that and build their business. That's what we do. That's what our purpose is. So we mirror and match the behavior. That starts with the cadence of speech. We've talked about that. We know whether they are on the right side of the y-axis because they're smiling or they're on the left side of the uh, of the y-axis because their eyebrows are, for, are sewn together and they're not smiling because they think we're going to lie to them or we're going to cheat them or we're wasting their time. That's great for identification, especially when you're in front of them. A little bit more difficult on the phone. So the next step for us is matching the behavior and you, you just need something more to see in order to get to that point. So what we're going to do is talk about the characteristics of that behavior. Now, before we do, tell me this. Are you meeting cold, warm, <clears throat> pardon me, or hot sellers or buyers? What is your clientele list primarily made up of? Cold, warm, or hot, or is it a balance of such? Who are you meeting? What do you mean by cold, hot, or balanced? Like, okay. could you elaborate? Yeah, absolutely. Cold, they've never met you before. They don't know who Remarket is. They don't know what you can offer. They have no idea who you are. Warm, they know about the auction services. And I mean yours, not specifically vehicle auction or asset liquidation, but they haven't dealt with you before. And hot, they know who you are. They know who Remarket is. They know where you're located. They've maybe even had experience with you or someone has said, I use Remarket. We're hot. That's 90 hot. 90% hot. <laughs> okay, Terrell? We're doing business with people we know on a first name basis consistently. Okay, great. Excellent. Terrell, about the same? Yeah, I would say the majority of our uh, interactions are hot. There are definitely new ones that <clears throat> we sign up and over time they become, you know, they go from cold to, to hot. So um, yeah, I'd say it just takes a little bit of time when it's somebody new and then we get them, get them uh, that relationship built and whatever. But um, I think where it might be colder than we think bill is the fact that a lot of guys being that they're buying online and we email them bills of sale. We don't have a lot of, uh, personal relationships with these people in terms of the um, knowing a bit about them, knowing what their interests are and getting to know the person, you know, well, that was one of the things I learned um, a lot at enterprise is when you want to do business with somebody, you want to get to know them personally because friends do business with friends. And, um, you know, we are <clears throat> selling vehicles and it's kind of a cold, um, uh, thing um, but if we can get them emotionally engaged and and find out what their interests are uh, maybe we can do more business with these people when you are um, following up with them after the sale effectively trying to get to a bid and and finalize and get to the point of, of sold are they are, do you struggle with those that you ha haven't done business with a lot in the past? <clears throat> or um, would you say you struggle with everyone equally when they haven't been the highest bidder and the vendor hasn't accepted the offer? And so there's there's this uphill climb. Would you say they're warm, hot, or cold as a lead that you're trying to finalize the sale on? 
Yeah. Put it this way. If, if it's somebody we haven't um, built a great relationship with, or, you know, it's just cut and dry. Hey, do you want it or not at this price? Uh, this is the counter. Do you want it or not? You know, whereas somebody we know a little bit better, we can be like, oh, come on, Jeff, you know, this will work. You can make this work. You know, it's only, you know, $800 more. And, you know, that's where having that relationship, you know, you know, you can push them along and needle them a little bit into, you know, making the buy, you know. Right. But the same, Lindsay, for you? Each person is different and it depends on what you're going to them with. I mean, if I go to someone with a $5,000 counter, I mean, of course, they're going to be a little bit cold, right? <sighs> I guess if it's a half million dollar car, yeah, probably a bargain. <laughs> but they probably don't have very many of those. Also depends on how much they bid up to. I mean, if they bid up to the max of their budget already and they're getting a $5,000 counter, it's going to be cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... I hear you. And, and and I'm glad you said that because I didn't even think of it in that capacity. Cold, what I would mean by cold is this person's never dealt with you before and not necessarily familiar with this process. Mm -hmm. Like at, at Odessa, they either get it or they don't, right? Mm -hmm. Very few are ever going to follow up afterwards and say, hey, you know, you were really close to owning that. You're only $5,000 away. That is probably in most owners and independent retailers and <laughs> used car managers. That's probably not considered close to any mm -hmm. of them. But mm -hmm. for you guys, that's close, right? Now we've got a hard and fast number that the vendor wants. And it's time to go back to the buyer and say, this may not necessarily be great news. Uh, but you've dealt with us a lot in the past, and I don't want to—I don't want you to miss out on an opportunity that you thought was good for you. You were the highest bidder, but I actually have a number now. Mm -hmm. Where before we you know, reserved, we didn't have a number, and and so that would be that would be you know if they've never dealt done with you dealt if they've never done business with you in the past, that'd be cold. But if, mm -hmm. if it was someone that you've, they've done business with you in the past, it'd be warm or hot. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I draw that to your attention because as we go forward in these customer value categories, it's going to make a lot more sense because it's a lot of fun to go through these categories. So there are five categories that we're going to talk about. And one category does not apply to us whatsoever at all. But I need it to round out the population so that 100% of the population is covered and you know how to go after these people. This is another reason why Zoom is so dynamite. And especially for you going to them after the sale, going, going to a Zoom meeting, try to catch them on a Zoom call. Now you can call them up and you can say, hey, look. I've, I've got my Zoom window open. Can I send you a quick note here? Now you can share your screen. Now you can go back to the vehicle card. Now you can go back to the vehicle description and you can leverage all of that as opposed to just saying, look, it's it's only 800 bucks. And they go, yeah, but it's 800 too much. So look, the only way that money is made at the auction is when you buy, okay? And that's the only way money's ever made. So if $800 puts this vehicle out of the realm of possibility when you're going to make 45, 56, 6500 dollars, 10 grand profit on it. I get it. I totally get it. So let me show you what that vehicle looks like. And when you've got it on the screen, it's very visual and you're talking to them and they see your face, it's dynamite. For you guys, the other side of the equation, at least cut five customer value categories. So belongers. Belongers are, are the first and one of the largest percentages of the population. And it's really going to make a lot of sense in a second. Belongers don't like technology. Belongers are easy to identify. Their hair is a little bit messy. They wear old, worn out clothing. They, interestingly enough, drive old automobiles. Uh, the, the fascinating part is a lot of our independent rural dealers are probably belongers. They don't like newfangled and fandangled. So you'd never say something like, our auction is brand new. It's amazing. It's terrific. It's it's this. It's, it, is, it is that. It's amazing. They like tried, tested, and true. This is 38% of the population, one of the largest demographics that are out there. 
Uh, they actually don't really, well, in my opinion, if, from an observation perspective, I don't think they really like to work. So when you call them for a bump with a uh. belonger, it's really difficult for them to accept it because they're just so tried, tested, and true. Level as as a uh, as as a table. Uh, they're just solid as a rock. And maybe you've heard them say things like that before. They're like, my last bid is my highest bid. There is no more. I'm not giving any more. Don't call and ask me for more. That's it. And you say, come on, really? Are we thinking clearly as average gross profit on a vehicle? NADA starts this weekend, right? The National Automobile Dealers Association Convention down in Las Vegas. Look, I'm getting statistics from the NADA that the average gross last year was $4,700 plus dollars, Canada and the U.S. We're talking about $800 difference. Worst case scenario, you ask $5,500 and you're still above average gross. Worst case scenario, you give up the 800, you negotiate a little bit more and you take a $3,500 gross. My point is you are missing out on an opportunity. And I'm just calling you because that's how I do it. Rather than you were the highest bidder and how every other auction house does it, every other average ordinary auction house does it. I'm calling you to say, hey, for 800 bucks, you can still make $4,200 gross profit on this vehicle. And you get a customer and they know two people who will buy. And if it's a new car franchise and you've got a service department opportunity now, and you've got summer tires or winter tire storage coming up in what? Three months time. And the ball can tumble. These belongers don't want to hear that the vehicle has some latest and greatest fan dangle technology. These belongers don't want to hear that it has 0% financing on the new car side of the equation. So there's lots of advertising to draw people in. These belongers don't want to hear that you guys have some special technology in the auction field, in the auction house world. And they don't want to hear that you, know, you only pay this way. Plus, this is the hardest one to get on the Zoom call. So you may want to just suggest them, hey, you want to hop on a Zoom with me? I can take you through the vehicle again. I can show you the condition report just to make sure that we're not missing out on our opportunity. They could be like, no, no, don't push the envelope with a belonger. So this is a tough one. You're going to have to know who they are. Maybe you want to do a Google search on them. Maybe you want to have a look at where their dealership is. Hopefully there's a street level Google view of what it is. If it's the little naked light bulbs hanging across the front of the lot and it's a gravel lot with a construction trailer at the back, you got yourself a belonger. You could have another value category. We'll touch on that. But you're likely, if they've been there for 20 years, 25 years, if they've never moved for 40 years, if their grandfather had this dealership right here, this very spot, they're a belonger. So you don't want to push the technology. Their age range is huge as well, 34 to 65. Um what we find is that belongers sometimes transition from another demographic to another. We find a lot of emulators and achievers and even socially conscious transition to belonger with the, with the birth of a child. And doesn't have to be the first, second, or third. So Terrell, this could be very well happening to your son. All of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, Corvette would be an awesome car to have. The C8, it's a beautiful car. But you know what? I'm thoroughly enjoying my caravan. Uh, it's, it's not the same automobile, but it's so functional. You, we can put the stroller in sitting upright you know, and one day I may have that Corvette. That's a classic belonger. And actually Dodge did a commercial. If you remember that they, when they owned Lamborghini, they had Lamborghini and Ferrari and, and actually posters made up that said, uh, justification for higher education. If you remember any of those. And as you go down the line, all of a sudden there was this family of five, three kids, two, two adults standing in front of their caravan, a town and country. Yeah, it was the best one, but it was like, that's a caravan parked beside 
like a, a GT40 and a, and a Ferrari uh, and and a Viper and a Lamborghini. I think it was a Diablo at the time. He's like that seems just out of place. But performance is measured in in various ways. Their income range is really quite large as well, from 40 to 80k, and that's why we call them belongers. It's a very conservative because they're thinking of some other things. Now you can have children born into a belonger mentality and they never break out of it. Generally, significantly influenced by adults and parents that say, you know, just get the tried and tested true one. Don't buy the, the, the technology till it's perfectly proven. So the really cool part with these belongers is talking about what they like. What are the characteristics about them? Family values are really high with them. So you'll hear in your dialogue and conversation, and now that you've shared with me, Lindsay, that they're warm to hot people you're dealing with all the time, family. You, know, you say, what? How was your weekend? Like, hey, it was great. Like Terrell, I just celebrated a birthday or I saw my grandson and my son and his family were over and, oh, we had a, a wonderful dinner. Family traditional meals, really important to them. Not that you would slow your speech down for these people. That has nothing to do with anything. Belongers can be fast speaking and belongers can be very slow speaking. That goes to the subconsciousness. The purpose of the belonger is that you don't say something really obvious that could frustrate them. They like old fashioned things. So they talk about, you know, when I used to go to the sale, I used to stand beside the auctioneer. What happened to those days? To make a belonger feel more comfortable, you can say, you know what, we're noodling that. We're actually noodling that. We're thinking, you know, we may have a block, but right now this is, yeah, because of the current climate that we're in, the pandemic and recovering from the pandemic, uh, what we're finding is a lot of our clients are, are becoming very comfortable with not leaving their city, town, village, the comfort of their own office. So belongers don't like the technology, but you're saying all the things that play into it for them. If they're coming from, from Red Deer all the way down to Calgary, they're going to the big city. Not that Red Deer is the little hick town that it used to be when I knew it was, it was Red Deer. Now it's grown exponentially too. But pick that little tiny 10,000 population place that you've got a dealer you do business with. If they don't want to hear, yeah, you know what? You got to come into the city. You got you got to come there. Like, no way, the traffic and the hustle and bustle. Here's the best thing about a belonger. They're incredibly loyal. You win them over and you make sense to them. They won't go anywhere. So you have no competition with other auction houses. Now, these this is what they don't like. As I've touched on seconds ago, change. New fangled, new, new stuff. Um, they're resistant to change. They, they fear technology. They don't believe online banking is safe as much as they do it. They've accepted the fact because they haven't been ripped off, but they probably have the latest story and they probably have an amazing story of someone that's really been taken advantage of. They adopt, they, they are resistant to being an early adopter. They prefer the paper system over anything that's new. Now, here's the really fascinating part. Whether you see them in person or you see them here in Zoom, they wear clothes that are dated. Their clothes are not pressed. They're, they almost look worn out. They generally wear casual a lot of casual clothing if they are in a suit it's probably a little old it's missing the the crease especially on the sleeve now where would these people shop where would these people get most of their clothing what do you think walmart yeah absolutely 100 percent. so if you don't know what george is selling at walmart that's their <laughs> brand the walmart brand right <laughs> Then you need to go in one day when you're passing Walmart, you said to your spouse, or even better, if she says, look, I got to go shopping. I'm going to Walmart. I say, I'll come with you. <laughs> they go, what? You never come shopping with me. What's wrong with you? No, I, I need to go. I got to do a little bit of research. Wander through 
Terrell, George. stay out of the ladies lingerie part. Okay. That, that, that'll just get you in trouble. Okay. That's the best <laughs> suggestion I can give you there. Wander through the men's and ladies clothing and just see what they're carrying. Okay. See what the colors are. See what the design is. Uh, certainly if there's something that you'd like to buy, definitely support it. We got to make sure we don't go into this recession. So you do your part to, to keep us going through. So spend your money, spend your money, spend your money. But the point is, see what they're carrying. Where else would these people shop other than Walmart? What do you think? If they're wearing a suit, where would they buy their suit other than Walmart? Maybe the Bay. I I'm not sure. Like, Yeah, the Bay is a good one. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Now, the bay might be the closest thing to expensive for them, but Tip Top Taylor, do you guys have Tip Top out yep. there still? Great. We've got it here in Ontario. That's where they go to the suit store. What's a suit store called? Do you do either of you know what, what a suit store is called? A men's suit store? Sorry, this is out of my department. I'm female. <laughs> so. Terrell, any guesses? Uh, like what the belonger calls it? No, what anybody calls a men's clothing. Haberdashery? Yes, the haberdashery. So they would say something like that. Oh, I, 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 I may go to the haberdashery to... Where does that word come from? I've never heard that word in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Lindsay. It's falling by the wayside. Good for you, Tur Terrell. I don't get a lot of people that know it. So excellent. Good for you. It's so old world. Isn't that a belonger? Yeah, it Doesn't... sounds like something from like the 1900s. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> and it is from the 1900s, right? That's yeah. why we say a men's clothing store. I say it now and I feel like it's exclusive, right? But let's go back to the to the teen, the tens, teens, and twenties at the turn of the century, the the nineteen hundreds. I mean, and th those are the only people that went to work, right? The ladies stayed at home and they cultivated and curated the home and raised the family. And the man, he went and bought a suit and always dressed in a tie, and he went out and he shopped at the haberdashery. Now you say haberdashery and Lindsay word. goes, but have a what? <laughs> it's a very silly word. <laughs> it's silly. And, and uh, I get a ton of people that go, did he make that up? Like, is that really a word? <laughs> and I go, yeah, Google it. Yeah, bring Siri up. Hey, Siri. So anything along those lines, traditional. That's why Zoom is so fantastic. And this is what you can leverage as Trey, you asked earlier. What about when we go out and meet people in person? Right, you see that gravel parking lot construction trailer at the end, and it's old, not new, not a nice new Armstrong construction trailer. I mean, this thing is an old, old, old Armstrong, and the lights are still out there, and 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 a third of them, half of them, don't work anymore, and their automobiles look the same way. Like especially if you drive by one of those lots, and they've got the antenna hanger with the frillies on it. Do you remember those? Right? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of tough to put that on the shark fin of a roof today, right? For the <laughs> yeah. antenna. Like, there's no way that's going on. And I can't imagine they'd have any automobile with a fixed mast antenna. But this is that kind of individual. This is that kind of business owner, right? And you go, oh my gosh, no, I was right. I really saw this belonger. And when you go to talk to them, they'll frustrate you because like, ah, and they, you can get a 35 year old acting like a 70 year old. Isn't that hilarious? What kind of watch do you guys wear? I've got a Garmin. I, I, I love my Garmin. What do you wear? I don't wear one. I use my phone for the time. Good. Terrell, you wear a watch at all? I typically don't, but I do have some fossil watches that, uh, you know, when I'm going to a fancy occasion or something, I'll wear as like more of a jewelry piece than a than a functional piece. Because of course, we all use our phones now, right? So Absolutely. Excellent. Now, if you see they have a flip phone, don't pull your phone out to check it when you're with them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Harry, pen and paper, especially if you're out in the field. There we go. Pen and paper, right? And the second part of the equation is if you do wear a Garmin or an Apple Watch or worse, a Breitling, a TSOT, a Tag Heuer, a Rolex, take it off. 
before going into that place. If you if you didn't take it off and you didn't realize that and you have a lot of jewelry on, leave your jewelry on, but hide it because they don't like, and especially a, an Apple watch or any one of the electronic watches. The fascinating thing with my Garmin is uh, I'm, I'm a fitness fanatic as well. So I, this, uh, my wife gave it to me for Christmas. It's a Phoenix seven and it tracks everything. And now I'm wearing it in my sleep and it's tracking my sleep and it's tracking my rest. And it's telling me where my VO two max with the oxygen inside my blood. And, and I'm getting ready for 150 K race this weekend, a fat bike race and off all, all off road. And it's going to be warm, like minus two, which is fantastic. Every other year it's been minus 26. Anyway, it tells me what my fitness age is. So I'm 56 this year and it's saying on my watch right now, because I'm not as fit as I am in the summertime, I'm only 53 and I have the potential to be 48. <laughs> and I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to be 48. I'm going, for, I'm going full throttle right towards, you can just imagine a belonger would have zero tolerance for this conversation. They'd be like, yeah. Why? Why would anybody do that to themselves? Why would you ride a bicycle at minus 26? That's the point of studying all this stuff. So as we move forward to the next customer value category, you'll get a charge out of this one, our emulators. I'll bet dollars to donuts, as much as you say, excuse me, belongers drive me crazy. I'll bet emulators drive you crazier because emulators are beer budget, champagne taste. And I actually got that backwards. I should have said champagne taste with a beer budget. Yep. These are all your new entry level managers. These ones are pretending to be in the role. They're a small percentage of the population at 20%. And what percentage of your customers do you think are emulators? Would this be a smart buy, Troll? No. I don't think so myself. I think Smart Buy does have the champagne but um wallet. Okay. This is the it's young manager, budget. right? And Yeah, and but I think if he didn't have the champagne wallet, he would still be an emulator if he did not have that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's I his just... personality type not talking about his budget. Yeah. Yeah. But he does have the big budget. Mm -hmm. Does does he spend money conservatively? Spend money liberally? Liberally. Is he flexible with bumps? Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. Is he new in the role? No. Not really. Okay. Um, but he is flexing his like his his trips, and you know, like. And he always has like that kind of lifestyle. You know what I mean? Kind hey, of how, feels. How long has he been in the business? Is he new? No. I would suggest 15 years. Okay. And and so, same behavior or has he changed his behavior? Is all of a sudden he's on a spending spree and living the life? My opinion of him is he married money. And they've set him up to have a lot of um of a bankroll to buy and sell cars and he's a massive wholesaler and you know but he doesn't really think about his purchases though he just buys yeah we figured out he buys based on price not based on condition or mileage so hey, and does, does he ever question it after say, I don't want it, or I bid and I shouldn't have, or you guys didn't describe it accurately? No, and... he'll call and be like, did you guys call this, this, and this? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, but he's not looking for his money back, or he's not saying, uh, the, the boss won't let me spend this money? No, so it's his company, so it's his money. Okay, so hang on to that thought. Great for bringing it up, Lindsay and Terrell. That's not an emulator. Emulator yeah. works for somebody. Unquestionably, okay. absolutely. And they're, uh, think of the emulator as the rising star. So they're trying to get themselves established. And, sure. and, and you, uh, an emulator will, will be talking to you on the phone and go, hey, 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 what do you do with that? Yeah. 
All right. All right, Carrie. What was that? What were you talking about? Like they're making it look like someone that they have seen do that and they want to be involved in everything. And they're almost like a micromanager, but they really don't know what they're doing because nobody teaches, uh, teaches us or them how to be a manager in the role, right? It's all osmosis and observation. So they see the boss do that. And now the boss has been promoted or quit or left or retired or whatever. And then they're asking everyone, what are you doing with that? Where are you going with that? Who's got the keys? Hey, I've got someone I, I'm going to show that to you. And their desk, desk is a mess. They typically have food stains on their shirt, their tie, their jacket. You laugh, Terrell. It, it is classic. It's amazing. They're driving the nicest luxury used vehicle on the lot. And you could have dealer kids that are emulators. A lot of the dealer kids our emulators, right? They look at mom and dad and everything that they have and they just want to be there, right? We joke about the, the various generational differences and how the millennials uh, just, just as soon as they graduate university, they'll do a week of sales and a week of management. And then by the end of the month, I need to be running the company. Like I don't have a lot of time to fool around here. You know, <laughs> life is too short. I want to hurry up and retire in five, 10, 15 years, right? They all want to retire by 50 and 55. Those are emulators. Champagne taste, wheeler, 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 dealer, beer budget. They're workers. They've got a boss. They've got governance. They've got procedure. And typically they don't follow it. Their age range speaks for itself. So 15 to 36, they're young. Now we don't have any 15 year old managers. Um, I, I should have updated that. The, this is relative to salespeople as well. Probably more accurately that is, and I thought I had updated it, 25 to 36 is the emulator. Okay. The emulator is a fast step. It's a brief step on their entire career path. And you'll find that a lot of managers are salespeople that just want to be in management. They don't know why. Yeah, they, they may say things like, well, I want consistent income, but they want to be the leader. They want to they want to be the boss telling everybody else what to do. So their income is is rather indicative of that fast first step. Right. They want to go from where they were selling cars. Maybe they were making 80, 90, 100, 120 K a year selling cars and they come down to a forty five, fifty thousand dollar uh, base rate of what? what's that? Uh, 4,000, 4,500 bucks a month base. And then it's heavily weighted on commission. So this is the reason why your emulators are a pain in the derriere to you because they bid and they bid, they bid, and then they stop. I mean, like we're, th we're 800 bucks away from a deal. No, no, I can't do it. Boss says, I can't do it. No, no, I'm all the money. If you can't get your vendor to come to come down $800, like why, why should I have to go up? Because they're not confident in their ability. So you need to find that pain point. You need to demonstrate clearly why they're wrong because they're an emulator. They want to be right. They want to be seen as being an authority and know what they're doing. And yet they're afraid because no one's really taught them. And they, they just want the lifestyle. They want the image and everything that goes along with that. So they're they're all about looking cool and hip and being the, the, the loudest voice in the room because that's the sexiest, that's the best and everything that, that they have and do. Here's the easiest way to tell an em emulator. They got an iPhone 14 Pro. They spent $2,000 on this thing that they throw on the desk. And treat it like an old flip phone, which I think is ridiculous and idiotic. But how much does it cost to get an iPhone 14 Pro? How much does it cost to get it? I don't know, actually, because I'm against iPhones. <laughs> yeah, I don't like iPhones either. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an Android guy. So what does it cost, Bill? Two grand? 30 bucks a month. Right. Okay. We'll just put it on your pay plan. Don't worry about it at all. Oh, we'll right, trade right. your old phone in. Yeah. Oh, 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 look. Oh, you're eligible for an upgrade. You've had your phone for a while now. And I'm looking at the amount of, of using you. Yes, I am. I am available for an upgrade. You must have noticed my suit. <laughs> I'm the used car manager down at the local lot. And they get that crazy <laughs> expensive phone that they don't need. A flip phone or in fact, a phone on their desk. 
is more than what they need, right? They're going to be doing all their bidding. And these people are a riot to work with. Fast speaking, classic fast speaking, talkative, just, blah, 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 just puking data all. Yeah, go ahead. I Lindsay. think I, I think I know someone, Terrell, perhaps uh, that numbered company that used to, Kahane. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Kahane, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So when you get an emulator and you identify them as an emulator, and you may you may want to make sure that you're correct when you're talking to them and you say something like uh, to an emulator, how long have you been doing this for? Like, yeah, you know, it's so great to be able to talk to you on the phone. You pick the phone up right away. How long have you been doing? They go, I just got in the job. All the warning bells go up, right? All your warning bells go off. Like the, the screen starts flashing, warning, warning. Be careful <laughs> what, what they say yes to. Don't believe everything they say. Because they could buy, they could give you the the bump bid, and then minutes, hours, day later, no, we can't take that. Now, boss says uh, uh, our, we're tapped out on our line of credit, so we 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 can't buy it all. They get it to the dealership, and they're like, "You didn't tell me about this scratch. It's clearly identified there in the report. Yeah, but it's an inch and a quarter long. Your measurement said it was an inch." Yeah, then chalk it up as wear and tear. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> be wary with these emulators because yeah. they're afraid to make a mistake. There it is right there. What do they hate? They don't want to look stupid in front of their friends. They don't, they do not want to look stupid or careless or foolish in front of their boss. They don't want to look out of touch. They don't want to look uneducated. They don't want to look inexperienced. And yet they don't want to look old. They don't want to act old. And so they'll blame everybody else. You know, the the old guy did this. Well, these old guys aren't doing anything, you know, and and then they'll act old. These young kids, you can't teach them anything these days. You, you talk to them like, <laughs> you're 26. What, what, what do you think you are? <laughs> They're awesome. They're a lot of fun. Just be wary of them. Typically fast speaking, but it doesn't have to be. Now, our third category is achievers. Lindsay, this is that guy. Go back Party. to that guy. Yes. Smart the kid. Buddy? Yeah. The yep. kid with the money and he's, he's buying and he can be a little bit careless. He's transitioning from emulator. Now you see how each one of these steps, they bounce around. This is why I don't start with the customer value categories because our behavior D I S and C never changes these categories. People change. So as that guy, what was his name again? Terrell? Marty. Marty. As Marty becomes more seasoned, more of a professional, more familiar with his role, more confident in his ability, then he'll start to be more of a consistent achiever. And does Marty buy expensive vehicles? He can. Yep. Does he pay the most? He's Sometimes. consistently on top on a lot of vehicles and i'm always surprised when he is <laughs> he's an achiever he wants his yeah. cars to be the best looking cars around he wants to, to, to tell people he paid the most he wants you to see that he did that and your dialogue with marty is marty marty of all my clients marty listen to me i would never call anyone other than you because nobody else sees the value in this automobile like you do. This is the perfect automobile for your clientele. And he's like, no, 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 I paid all the money. Marty, we're 5K away from a deal. Marty, it's time to step up. It's step up or step aside. You can be like everybody else or you can be the achiever. This will put me, us, and you ahead of everyone else. Martin, I am not paying that much. There's no way. It's not worth it. Marty, Marty, the next one's on me. The next one, we get a vehicle that is undervalued. I will personally send you a text from my smartphone and save you that money. Marty, you got to help me out here. I'm only calling. I can't go to anybody else, Marty. This is the, and you just keep doing it. You just keep barraging him with, with adjectives and nouns and modifiers. And then he goes, okay, okay, okay. Oh, <laughs> you guys, you're killing me. Like Marty, 
The best time to buy is before Valentine's. You don't want to wait for the stuff till after Valentine's. After Valentine's, they go up by 30, 40%. You want the stats on that? You want me to send you some? Yeah, send me some stuff on that. Send me some data on that. That's no problem at all. Get off this call. I'll go dig that up. I got to find it first. And you don't have to worry about finding it. They're not going to look at it. The fact is you thought of Marty. It's The fact isn't that you have the data. Achievers love this stuff. Now, Achiever, they want to see that watch. So if you're going out on the road, Terrell, you put that fossil in the car and you know you're going in to see Marty, fossil on, rings, bling it out, the big gold chains all over, <laughs> right? <laughs> Marty's constantly on his, on his, uh, he doesn't respond to email. He's too savvy to be on email because he's oh. on his phone. Do you know what I mean? Savvy's old, so, Lindsay. Yeah. yeah. Sa sa email's done. Right, yeah. e email's finished. Sorry, I can't. I can't respond to your email on, on my phone, so I I have to call you. <laughs> <laughs> totally, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And why is he calling you? Because he's got an earbud in. He's yeah. walking around. He's 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 the guy at the supermarket. Yeah. He's talking mm -hmm. around like this, and and you think they're talking to you, and you're like, yeah, yeah, it is a good day. He's like, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, somebody just answered me. Like, weird. <laughs> and they want to walk up and they want to make you feel bad about it, right? This is the one you get dressed up for. Now, the beauty with achievers is that if you are going on the road and you're going to see several achievers, and quite frankly, a lot of automobile dealers are achiever type behaviors, customer value category, right? Then you dress for that. You put on your very best suit. Uh, I've, I've suggested this for years. I have one of my closest friends, very successful man. He shops for his Armani suits and his wife shops for her Chanel dresses at a secondhand store in Toronto. Oh yeah. There's, there's a website called Poshmark. You can buy secondhand. Absolutely. And they markups. advertise, they yeah, advertise like a designer. ton on Facebook and on Kijiji, don't they? Yeah. I'm all, I'm not like top designer. Like I don't think I could do Chanel, but I do like the Kate Spade, which is like just below it. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. And it's always like secondhand, except like it's, it's hard because if you buy secondhand, sometimes you can't, you get knockoff stuff, right? It's hard. How much Chanel secondhand do you see? A lot. You do. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Cartier, everything. Okay, Cartier is different. Uh, do you know the Chanel retailer close to you, Lindsay? No. Do you, I don't... Terrell? Probably Holt Renfrew, I'm imagining, downtown Calgary. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now go to Holt's and find out who Ch typically Chanel gravitates to boutiques. Ladies' boutique, men's store would be the haberdashery. They wouldn't be carrying Chanel. There isn't Chanel for, for men. Maybe a cologne, but anyhow, go to those stores. You know, when you've got time, just kicking around and do it every quarter, once a quarter. Wander in, peruse around, and then leave. And make a mental note as best you possibly can of the clothing that is there. Any idea why the most copied, coveted brand is Chanel? Any idea no. why? No. Terrell, any guess? Um, it's probably because they're like the number one luxury brand of success and fame and fortune and true. But there's a lot of others that do that. Yeah, like Armani's Louis Vuitton. A good one, right? Louis yeah. Vuitton. Yeah. yeah. Why yeah. Chanel? Prada. Why Chanel? Yeah, Prada, absolutely. But Chanel is above all of these. Why? I don't know that brand as well as I maybe should. I I'm not sure. When the retailer buys Chanel and cannot sell it, they can send it back to Chanel. And what does Chanel as the corporation do with that returned clothing? Handbags, belts, shoes. Do they destroy it? Yes. Mm -hmm. They burn it. If it isn't if it isn't fashionable and and they can't resell it to another um, new an, another boutique that is their brand, then yeah, they destroy it. Yeah, and I think that's why used it's yeah. so hot, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Prada, you, I think you were going to say, yeah, that, yeah. I think they do the same. Yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. And a lot of brands are starting to recognize that. Interestingly enough, iPhone, Apple in, in, in general, started the trade-in process much earlier than everybody else did. Now, I don't think they give you a reasonable amount trade-in. Uh, I, I don't even think it's 50% if your product is less than, than a year old. And I don't know how many people would capitalize on it. But interestingly enough, they've recognized that. Let's bring that product back rather than having that old product out in the marketplace. Because how many of your friends have a smartphone with a cracked screen? How many of your friends have a smartphone right now with a cracked screen? Not many. Okay. But have you seen it before? Uh-huh. Not my screen's cracked. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Really bad. <laughs> oh, is it? I'm all about practicality, though. Like, it still works fine. So <laughs> so it works in, in two capacities for that for that manufacturer that, that made it, right? They mm. either say, yeah, ours is the Army military tested, perfect one, even broken, it'll work. Mm -hmm. And then there's Apple that says, no, 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 we don't want that. We don't want that in the marketplace. Anybody that has an Apple, it's always perfect. So trade it in or we'll fix it. And of course, the Apple Store and the Genius Bar and Apple Care. It doesn't matter what you do to it. If, if you damage it, they'll fix it, right? Isn't that fascinating? So what is the Achiever brand of phone and jewelry for, for Achievers? What's the oh, Achiever definitely brand? definitely Apple. I mean, they don't care how it works as long as it's makes you a better person when you buy it it's like a freaking cult <laughs> <laughs> it does it makes you a better person mm -hmm. you'll be so much with achievers it's more about i've got there with emulators it's i'm getting there do you see the differentiation so there's a lot of crossover we can make a lot a, a bunch of mistakes with them that's why the population percentage here is the smallest next to the very last one, which really doesn't count because you can't stay achiever. At some point, you stop achieving. At some point, you get to the retirement years. At some point, you get mothballed, no matter who you are. You can be Warren Buffett, for that matter, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, rest his soul before he passed. At some point, as great as you're achieving, somebody goes, yeah, but they're old. Ah, yeah, they're smart, and they're rich, but they're old. It's time for the new wave. So we won't talk about what percentage of population is your achievers because it's going to be a huge percentage of remarket, right? The age range is older. This is an easy way for you to identify that you have an achiever. As much as that, that guy, Marty, looks achiever, he's transitioning from emulator to achiever. That's why he's a little bit flippy floppy and I don't respond to email and email's dead. And you're like, Marty, how do you get a Facebook page? How do you get a Facebook account, Marty? How do you get an email uh, or pardon me, an eBay account, Marty? How do you buy anything off Amazon, Marty? You buy it with your email address, Marty. So as much as it's done, it's over, it's history, it's passe. Check your email, Marty. And I'll text you. It's no problem at all. I get it. SMS and I'll call you. And if we've got ringless voicemail, I'll send you a message. But check your bloody email. That's that's carved in stone. Income range, as you can imagine, is big, right? I just I just peg it at six figures. And of course, it goes into seven and eight. And there's a lot of emulators in the States outside of the car business that are doing a lot of online teaching and training. And they're emulators because they're saying, I make an eight-figure income. And a couple of them said, I make an 11-figure income. Well, clearly, they don't know how many zeros that is because even the bank has a difficulty giving a name to anything beyond a trillion. So and yeah, to, to say I'm I'm... I'm anything more than a four fig four uh, uh anything more than a 10 figure income is just beyond comprehension. Anyhow, these are those emulators again are an absolute blast. The achievers don't make that that kind of a statement. So for the achievers, it's all about exclusive and special and rare prestige. And they like your business executive point system if you have it or VIP cat, uh, VIP front of the line status. Uh, these are the ones with the American Express black card. Have you seen a black card? Yes. Oh, I have. And they love to flash it. 
<laughs> it's, it's so, so silly. <laughs> okay, so the secret to taking an American Express black card is you hold it with two hands as though it weighs like the physical weight that it is. Yeah, they so want this you is... to hear how hard it hits the table. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, a, an emulator takes out their credit card and fans it like, like a royal flush hand. They go, which one do you want? An achiever throws them on the car on the counter. That's how you can tell the difference between the two. The achiever's like, it, it means nothing to me. I get them all the time. People give them to me. Now the bank gave me that that American Express card. Like I didn't even want it. Do you know what uh what the requirements are to maintain the American Express black level card? Oh. I bet they have to pay a stupid fee. It is a husky fee. Yes, it is. But it's can... like, why are you paying so much money to have money? <laughs> <laughs> you must maintain a spending, not a balance. You must maintain a spending habit of 100K a month. Well, that was the original entry level or the, the barrier to, to, to enter the American Express black category. Nowadays, it's I think it's become easier um and it's becoming more popular because it is the differentiator and american express wants to differentiate themselves in that capacity they were always the ones with no spending limit right you could virtually buy anything and then the the black was no spending limit with no uh pre-authorized pre-authorization so you could literally go in and buy a lamborghini with your american express black card i don't think any dealer would allow do doing so because american express would just nail the retailer for their percentage of of, of doing that that uh that deal but things that the achiever doesn't like so you'd never say to marty marty you're like everybody else to me you would be done that would be it <laughs> just that uh, that's case closed book closes one thing they don't want to be like everybody else so marty 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 you're my best you're my favorite you're our best client you're incredible you know we treat you specially but marty you're like everybody else boom everything you built up to that point you just flushed right into the toilet you really got to catch yourself start the brain before engaging the mouth because you can't say marty you're like everybody else you know, whittling me down, presenting silly offers, needing to to go back to do second offers. Like Marty, come on, you got to step up. You got to see the value in this. You know, you know, be that guy. Be my be my number one. You can't say it because you said you're like everybody else. You know, complaining about the price of things. Can't do that to to achievers. So the last category is socially conscious that really applies to us. There's going to be one more category after this. The socially conscious are the granola and oatmeal eating crowd. Okay. They wear banana Republic. The clothes are, are, are wrinkled. Uh, the tie is never done up around their, their neck. What does their facial hair look like? What do you think? Probably like a five o'clock shadow. Maybe? Yes, yes, not nice and tidy like yours, but Terrell. not not unruly either. Not tidy. It's like right in the middle. It's like they're unshaven. I eventually you, put in effort, but just not today. <laughs> and you and you know why? Why are they doing that? Why are they unshaven? Because they woke up late for work. Maybe. Yeah. Why did they wake up late for work, Lindsay? socially conscious um i mean work is a priority but not like heavy a priority maybe you're 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 right there so take the heavily priority out work mm -hmm. is a priority you're absolutely right but you're absolutely right on not a heavily weighted priority i just say take that out because they don't believe that they want you to believe lifestyle is important and the reason why they have a five o'clock shadow or worse like a two-day unshaven beard it's like dude shave like if you want to grow that thing if you want to you want to learn how to grow a beard go on vacation for a week and come back with a beard like it's either on or off it, it not in between okay it looks terrible as it's growing in that's because i'm working so hard 
I am, I was up till four o'clock last night getting this dialed in and making sure, you know, the inventory is right and I'm following the market and we're not overvalued and we don't have water on our, on our statement and I'm working so hard, but they've got on the, uh, the suit that is kind of wrinkly and it's brand spanking new. And can you see their socks? Yes. Doesn't that, Terrell, does that drive you crazy? Like Lindsay, tell me if that's in vogue. Does that, does that, do you look at a guy with, with his pant legs? First of all, the, the slacks are tight against his legs. Right. And then the, the hem is about halfway up his calf and you see these funky socks and these gorgeous shoes. Is that sexy? Is that like, wow, is that guy put together? <laughs> no, I don't think I've put together when I see that. I mean, I look at them and this is what all, all the 30 something year olds were at Ford when I'm training them and we're going out to meet dealers. I go, okay. Um, our first stop is the Bay. Okay. Cause you're going to buy a suit where the pant leg goes all the way to your shoes. And then the socks, we know they're cool. They're great. And we all like to joke about them here in, in the ivory tower. But when we go out there in the field and we're talking to a 60, 70, 80 year old dealer, who is a belonger or an achiever, he doesn't want to see your short pants. The first thing out of their mouth, every single one of them. It was like clockwork. This was too funny. Hey, when's the flood? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> holy cow. I think I, I think I was in grade two when I first heard that. So that's a long time ago, right? When's the flood? And they love to say it. And of course, if you're the 30 something dressed in a, in a four, five, six, and an $800 suit that is made to look this way, they don't even know what that, that means. So these socially conscious are wanting to do the right thing in the environment. These are the ones buying all your electrification vehicles, right? They just love the whole idea of the electric. Uh, they're going to love the Toyotas with the hydrogen powered uh, when it becomes much more commercially uh, available uh, for, I don't know how many you guys get of the hydrogen powered Hyundais when, when they were first available six, seven years ago. I don't know how many of those are cycling through, but if, if Marty was remotely included in that socially conscious environment as an achiever, I mean, you call Marty right away, go Marty, you're not going to believe this. We got a hydrogen powered Santa Fe just listed in the sale. You got to get on this. I'll tell you when it's coming up. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. I need that. So you can guess what the percentage of your customer population is. Age range is a big one for these ones as well. So our percentage of population is bigger than Achiever, closer to Emulator. Now you can see where an Emulator could transition over into the socially conscious because they don't wear ties. Uh, the socially conscious wears what kind of shoes? Does a socially conscious wear in the summertime? I was going to say uh, uh, Birkenstocks. Yes, absolutely, Terrell. Birkenstocks. <laughs> what do they wear in the wintertime? <laughs> um, Uggs. <laughs> One shoe wear brand that has mixed up my presentation is sneaking into it. Blundstones. But... Blundstone, I believe, is more of an achiever, belonger brand. What you'll find that really socially conscious wears in the wintertime, Birkenstocks with wool socks. Yeah. That's a true socially conscious and in the snow. And you're just like, what are you doing? I can't believe it. Their age range, again, a little mixed up compared to um, emulator. But the reason I do the 15 to 85 is that it's very easy for an achiever to transition to socially conscious. They still like the nicer things in life. They like the recognition. They like the appreciation. That's why socially conscious attracts so much attention when I use that term. And of course, from an emulator who never makes it to achiever, realizes that that magic point in their life 50, 55, 60 years of age, they go, look, I'm just not going to make that level of achievement that I thought I would. And they become socially conscious. They've done very well for themselves. They're a good leader. They're a good manager. They're a good owner. They're a good business person, but they just recognize, yeah, I'm not going to have the place in Florida. I'm not going to have a private jet. 
I'm not going to join Muskoka Lakes Golf and Country Club in the Muskokas, but I'm perfectly happy with my private golf club close to where I am. I'm perfectly happy with my luxury car, and I'm perfectly happy going away to Florida for my trip, but I'm not going to own a house in a private enclave. Their, their income range is just like a blend of the emulator and the achiever. So you find, at least in Toronto, in Silicon Valley, We've got a lot of these socially conscious as business owners, and yet the employees in their organization are a lot of belongers and a lot of achievers, interestingly enough. And then just before we go then, because we are way over time, I'm really sorry about that, you guys. I love this part of the program. I really have a ball with it. Needs Driven is the only one that doesn't apply to us whatsoever at all. Smallest percentage of the population at 5%. They're living on, on, on bare, bare minimum. They're at the poverty line. They typically live in the street. And their greatest concern is putting food on the table and security for themselves. So you don't get that as, as a dealer. I don't think we would have that sort of thing. Uh, they'd be bankrupt and broke long before that that would be our greatest concern that they're just not paying their bill so that's all i have for you today did you enjoy this it was fun fantastic <laughs> great i hope i'm bringing that full circle now for you and we're now we're going to transition next month into the uh negotiation aspect of things this is full circle for that disc model the subconscious trance, and now seeing these buyer behaviors or, or these customer value categories, pardon me, they don't necessarily align and follow a faster, slow speaking pattern. You still need to establish that for you to develop subconscious negative prejudice with them, but you can see by the clothing they wear, how they act, what they say, the jewelry that's on them, the phone that they use, the decorations in their office, those key words that you want to use to really win them over and maintain their attention and for them to say you know what terrell Lindsay, smart people i really like dealing with that auction house. not the same kind of volume selection i have maybe at odessa but they treat me special they understand me they understand my business and that's worth more to me than simply having a whole bunch of product to choose from that i'm just competing with everybody else and i'm a number don't forget to book your one-on-ones this week. If it's going to get busy towards the, the uh, sale date, book earlier than later. Uh, Friday, the office is closed. So I start my big race on Friday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, and I'll be racing right through to Sunday, but we will have our normal program. Same great time. Tune in for these magnificent sessions, 930 on Monday morning. Once again, have a great day and a super week, Thank you guys. You. You're Thanks, welcome. Bill. You're good welcome. Luck. Have a good Thank run. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.